<clears throat> All right, I think we're gonna go ahead and get started. So uh, good morning, everybody. Welcome. Thank you for joining us on today's Zoom class. My name is Danielle. I'm the Visitor Experience Coordinator here at California Botanic Garden. And uh, briefly, before I hand it over to our presenter, I uh, just wanted to let everybody know, um, I see that um, everybody's already using the chat function. That's great. Um, if you have any questions, though, I am going to recommend that um, everybody uses the Q&A function. So go ahead and look at the bottom of your screen, and there's going to be a Q&A with little message bubbles. It's just easier for us to keep track of your questions that way. So go ahead and submit your questions that way. Um, if you submit them in the chat, we'll try to get to them. It's just a little bit easier if it's in the Q&A. Um, without further ado, I will introduce everybody to Stephen Valdez, the lead nursery technician here at California Botanic Garden. Stephen, take it away. Hey, what's going on, everyone? My name's Steven. I work over here at the California Botanic Nursery. Um, I'm, I'm the lead propagation tech. Um, am I coming up all right? You can see me all good? All right, I'm just gonna share screen now and we can get started. Da, da, da. Okay, so back to it. Um, so today I'm gonna um, just go over a very broad introduction to propagating native plants. Um, I'm gonna start off with just like a little bit of theory and going over some terms and concepts. Um, my, under, my position is to get you guys to kind of consider the how plants propagate themselves naturally. And of course, the, those are through two major methods of sexual reproduction and asexual reproduction. And so my idea is that by understanding that a bit more, um, you can then uh, deduce uh, how to manipulate those conditions in your home and try to kind of just control those environmental factors in your home and then hopefully get some success through propagating via seed, via cuttings, uh, divisions, and last we'll touch a little bit on layering. All right. So yeah, let's first start off with just a very broad discussion on what plant reproduction means and the two types. We'll start with sexual reproduction. And you know, it's pretty obvious um, what that means. It's, the, it's uh, the result is the production of a seed. And whether that's formed from two plants, you know, the pollen from one fertilizing the embryo in the other, or sometimes a self pollination in one plant, uh, the result is a production of a seed that is genetically different, but it does look physically similar. And of course, you know, straight species uh, do this, uh, pitcher sage, lepicinia fragrans, or, you know, California buckwheat. Um, those all produce seed, they reseed themselves naturally. And um, yeah, that's just one, one natural way of reproduction, right? Um, of course, this is generally the easiest and least intrusive way to propagate. Um, Although there are some setbacks being, you know, the time it takes to get a plant that's mature enough to begin flowering and really pushing out seed production, right? Um, also another drawback is many cultivars and hybrids cannot be propagated this way. So if you're buying a margarita bop from the nursery, um, you can't expect to sow the seeds that it produce, produces to get more margarita bop, right? You're likely gonna get like the default species version you know, it's gonna be the, uh, the blue flowering version ra rather than that vibrant purple. Uh, and then some cultivars or hybrids don't even seed or the seeds they produce are sterile, in which case you have to begin to understand like other methods of propagating those plants. So yeah, this is, I just wanna uh, spend this slide to really drive home the fact that seeds are so diverse. And what we're really talking about right here is the surface of this topic. Um, I just want you to know that there's so much variation um, that that variation then means we're looking at different uh, methods, different techniques to break the seed coat to, you know, some seeds have a very uh, thick seed coat. Let's see, like this pear, the seed coat is this brown orange color here. Okay. And then we have a, uh, this corn seed which has a bit of a thinner brown seed coat. So yeah, just something to get you thinking. Um, uh, some seeds are just very hard and they have a thick seed coat, in which case you can then begin to understand that, okay, maybe there's some process naturally that occurs to soften and break up that seed coat, okay? 
which we'll talk about a bit more later. Let's see. Yeah, and when we're thinking about these plants in their natural conditions, you know, some pretty obvious external con environmental conditions influence seed germination. And it's these conditions that we're gonna try to replicate in, at home in our own space. And things like available water, um, soil temperature, you know, it's warmer in the summer. Some species do better, germinate better in the summer because of that. Um, of course, oxygen supplies, the soil that a plant lives in is a very clayey and uh, saturated with water year round, or is it very humid? Stuff like that. Light quality as well. Some seeds, I believe it's uh, some lettuce seeds that are photosynthetic actually, and they do respond to light. So that's another thing to consider. Um, or uh, things like uh, nemophila, which germinate only in the absence of light, like complete darkness. That's, that's another thing to kind of think about. And of course, in natural environments, the existing plant population plays a big part on the success of germinating seeds. Uh, you can't expect you can't expect seeds to germinate very well if they're uh, like immediately underneath like a toyon or something like that that's shading, shading the soil and keeping it very cold year round. Also, some seeds require special events to occur before their uh, seed coat can be broken or before their embryo, the embryo that's within the seed can be um, um, released from its dormancy. And some of these things are like fire, uh, the acidity that occurs in digestion, uh, seasonal temperature changes, which are basically just a simple winter season shifting to spring season. And of course, some flooding in some desert species, which would uh, uh, break the dormancy of those seeds. So uh, with that knowledge, we can then begin to kind of make some judgments and uh, do some research on, in this case, we'll use a toyon as an example. Um, so if we learn more about a toyon, we could then learn more about how we can propagate toyon. Uh, so yeah, toyon heteroam heteromeles grows in a temperate chaparral, woodland, or forest. It's pretty moderate temperature. It's flowering season, May through August. That's, you know, mid-spring to summer. So now we're trying to think about, okay, when's the best time to harvest seeds, harvest the fruit? It's likely not gonna be during these months. We're gonna have to wait a bit, right? And of course, we, should, we can begin learning more about what kind of fruit it produces. Is it a fleshy fruit? Is it more of a nutlet? Is it something that's gonna come in a, a, a seed pod that's gonna split open when we touch it? Um, in this case, it's a palm fruit, which is, has a bit of a flesh component to it. And, uh, knowing that, we can then begin to think, okay, well, we're likely going to have to take some extra steps to remove that fruit from the seed, right? And of course, the seeds mostly germinate in early spring. So what this means is if it's flowering from May to August, it's the, the fruit are likely developing through the fall. Uh, they potentially might fall off into the ground sometime in the late fall through throughout the winter where they're where um, some cold temperatures might begin influencing their dormancy. And then as temperatures warm up in the following spring, those fallen fruit, which are likely dry by now, the seeds within are likely able to germinate now into new toyon, going into March and so on. All right, so now let's move on to asexual reproduction. So this, the, what we want to start thinking about with asexual reproduction is the plant's ability to uh, clone itself, essentially. So very simply put, it's just a plant's ability to create more copies of itself. And it, it can do this through various ways. Um, they, it, all of them involve the ability to produce adventitious roots. Um, these are roots that come out from anywhere that is not the main radical that comes out from the seed. So roots can come out from uh, buds, leaf buds. They can come out from the stem. Um, they technically, they theoretically can come out from any other part of the plant given the right circumstances. And I included some images here just to kind of get you thinking about uh, the main growing points in a plant. And it's these main growing points that we are trying to manipulate and target when producing new plants. 
So the left image, uh, let's see here. The left image shows a, um, a stem tip and a root tip. And those are also known as the shoot meristem and the root meristem. And these two areas contain a high concentration of dividing cells. And these are cells that haven't, uh, they haven't really been established as any particular cell. They're, they're basically the plant equivalent to human stem cells, more or less. They have potential to become, to become any plant cell. And so when we're thinking about, well, where's the greatest potential for creating root cells? Well, it's targeting tissues like that, that you find in the stem tip and in the root tip. And thirdly, there's another, um, what's called a, a meristematic tissue, and that is the vascular cambium, which runs through the stem of all plants. And let's see, this right image shows like a very simple diagram. If you were to get a stem of a plant and just cut horizontally, you'd get like a bit of a target image here. And we can just go through the different tissues real quick. The periderm, which is this black ring, that's what we're all familiar with. It's the bark for most species. This cortex, which is the brown ring, that's, uh, let's see, that's in some plants that can be the, bar, uh, the, the cork layer. And that's just, it has storage tissues. But what we're really interested is in the phloem, vascular cambium, and the secondary xylem, okay? Because the xylem and the phloem which you can think of as veins that run through the plant, the phloem carrying nutrients to the leaves and the xylem uh, carrying water up through the plant. Those two tissues are produced by this middle layer of vascular cambium. This cambium is a layer of dividing cells, dividing cells similar to what you would find in the stem tip and the root tip, right? But they're just oriented differently in this vascular column. Um, these dividing cells are dividing in two ways. They're dividing outward to eventually produce phloem cells, and they're dividing inward to eventually produce more xylem tissues. And so it's this meristematic region that we're targeting when we're trying to produce rooted cuttings. And that's, that's the reason why um, when reading about, you know, taking hardwood cuttings or um, trying to propagate um, uh, fruit trees or anything like that, there's always this mention of wounding the stem, right? It's because we're trying to expose that very, very thin vascular cambium tissue. We're trying to expose that so that we can then target it with some rooting hormones, or we can then begin subjecting it to different treatments and whatnot. And of course you have the pith, which is um, largely, it contains like some storage tissues and um, it's, it's the older cells of the plant. You know, they used to be xylem cells. And uh, yeah, hopefully that gives you some understanding of where we're, what we're thinking about when we're cutting, cutting the uh, uh, stems. And you can find these tissues in, in, in a, a softwood cuttings, hardwood, semi-hardwood. And it's the type of cutting that you're taking that's gonna depend, that's gonna influence uh, how easy it is to access that cambium layer. Okay, so back to asexual reproduction, right? Um, a, a major difference be between this and sexual reproduction is that you do get genetically identical offspring. So this is a major thing to consider when you find uh, any mutations in a plant that are favorable. Um, this is of course how a lot of um, uh, cultivars and hybrids are propagated because the, the genetics are able to be transferred from one population to the next. Um, you can retain any, you know, flower color that you like or any, uh, you know, if, there, if there's a, uh, if the leaves have a particularly interesting margin around them that you like, um, it's very likely that a mutation can be, can be passed, can be passed on this way. Let's see. And of course, like with seeds, there are varying degrees of success for propagating by, by cuttings or by layering, et cetera, and asexual reproduction. Um, so yeah, again, going back to some positives, it preserves cultivar and hybrid genetics. And you are able to get mature plants more quickly, especially if you take a larger cutting. 
Um, you're also able to get plants that will flower sooner and fruit sooner, which is something to consider. Okay, onward. And so yeah, now we're thinking about, well, this does happen naturally, although maybe rarely, and some plants do do this more often than others, right? And what are some of these external factors affecting adventitious root development? So if, um, simply put, just one factor is the soil proximity of these stem tissues. Um, if you can literally just take a stem of an existing plant and weigh it down so that it's touching the soil, and over time, that there is potential for that stem to then root into the soil where it's in contact. And the, the chance of it rooting is greater if there are axillary buds also present touching the soil there in, in that area. Okay, and other things like soil structure and moisture, these are also things to consider when germinating seeds, right? It's, it's pretty similar. Um, is the soil very soft and loamy? That's probably gonna favor root growth. Um, is, it, is it dark and moist? That's also gonna favor root growth. And um, some examples are many mints, mint species. Uh, I mean, if, if you've grown mint, you've probably regretted planting it in your garden because it's like a lot of them just spread because the stems are always touching the ground and it's such an herbaceous plant that it just loves rooting wherever it's touching the ground. All right, onward. So we've talked about the external factors uh, there's also some internal factors that we can just briefly touch on. Um, this, this topic alone can be like a four hour class. <laughs> so I just want to like just briefly introduce like one major plant hormone and that is auxin. Maybe some of you have heard of it, but auxin is a hormone that's produced by the plant in the growing tissues, in the buds of, of the plant, as well as the root tips of the plant. And what it does is several things. One thing is it, um, it establishes a dominance in shoots. So the highest point of a plant is producing a high concentration of auxin that's then overriding the potential for other buds on the plant to, sh to, uh, to sprout. But for our purposes, auxin, auxin also uh, increases the potential for roots to develop in stem, in stem cuttings. Um, so yeah, that's one thing we'll go into a bit more further on, but let's also talk about the age and growth stage of your parent plant. Um, you're likely not going to have um, a great success taking cuttings from a younger plant just because there's not a lot to pick from. Um, also, if you're trying to, if your plant that you want to propagate is flowering, that's likely also going to hinder the success of rooting because it's in a, in a different growth stage, it's, it's currently um, focusing on fire, uh, uh, flowering, producing flower buds and all that, and as well as fruiting. So if you were to take cuttings of a flower, flowering plant, you would likely just get cuttings that flower and then quickly die, unfortunately. So that's going back to the Toyon, that's kind of why we're considering, okay, when, when's the flowering season? When is it producing fruit? You know, when is it you know, not really flowering, et cetera? So yeah, let's revisit our theoretical imaginary toy on plant that's sitting right in front of us. Um, we've already gone over that where it grows, it's flowering during the spring and summer, the fruit fall off sometime in the fall and you know, they, they're they subject to cold temperatures throughout the winter, right? And then that following spring is when those seeds uh, have potential to germinate. But now let's add in an additional detail that helps us determine when we can take cuttings from this plant if we want to propagate it that way. And so if we were doing some, a little bit of research, we'll find out that, well, the Toyon begins putting out new growth in early spring. And so if we wanted to um, take cuttings from it, um, we'd probably want to try collecting in some time in April, uh, March, one of those months, um, because the, that, that soft wood will root more easily for a toyon. All right, so onward. Let's see. Danielle, are there any, would you like to take like a quick question? Anybody have anything to ask? Yes. 
Yeah, absolutely. So we were talking about the seeds germinating in um, early spring. Our question is, wh what exactly would be early spring? February? March? February. Yeah, mid-February, maybe. Um, basically, when the days begin to start, um, uh, the, the daylight is longer during the day, and uh, temperatures are getting more to like, I would say, you know, like upper 70 degrees, something like that. Yeah, that, that would be early spring. Okay, great. That's the only one I had for right now. All right, cool. Awesome. Okay, so we've had our, our, uh, our lesson in theory and understanding how seeds are produced, you know, what conditions affect their germination, um, what conditions favor root growth, adventitious root growth specifically, um, as well as when some plants might be pushing out new growth that can then be targeted for cuttings, right? So we have all this knowledge. Let's start getting our mater materials in order. Um, and I brought some, I'll try my best to show you what I have in person <laughs> with me. I'll just like probably hold it up to the camera. And um, yeah, we'll see about that. I also have a bunch of images to go through as well. So, okay, so you've probably heard of some of these ingredients. Uh, and I'll, tell, I'll let you know like which ones we use a lot in the nursery and which ones we try to uh, reserve for other different mixes. We do have different mixes that we use. We have like one specifically for germinating seeds. Um, we have one that's for, you know, liner plants that are in little, little two inch pots. Um, but yeah, they're all using the same ingredients just in different ratios. So perlite is one of them. Um, we usually get the medium sized one. Uh, I've used the small size and it's pretty awful because it just gets du so dusty and it's just not fun to work with. So try to go with medium size. I'm not sure if there is a large size, but anyways, perlite is, um, it's inert, it's chemically inert. It's not gonna contribute anything to the water that's being used to water it, or it's not gonna, it, there's no nutritional value to it. It's really just a substrate that can hold a little bit of water and allow for a, a lot of aeration in your medium. Um, oops, uh, cocoa coir which is a, um, a better uh, alternative to peat moss. Um, it's basically a very fibrous, dark material that can uh, absorb water. This as well will have just very minimal nutritional content in it. Um, maybe a bit of nitrogen, but it's not enough to really make a significant difference. And of course, peat moss, we, we do use this from time to time in the nursery. I am proud to say that our, we use coca coir in our production mix and that is more sustainable. So when you can, I would go for coca coir. Um, although you're probably spending a bit more money on it, but you know, it's just something to consider. We do use peat moss as well, we, uh, we do, and we screen it. So it comes in this big bale and it's very compacted, right? And so when you, when you buy that, um, you have to then break it apart. And so we have a screen that we use. Um, at home, you can probably use, um, oh, what's, what's the word I'm thinking of? Uh, a colander, like what, what, you've, what you pour spaghetti through, maybe something like that, or yeah, just something to grate, grate the peat moss apart, you know, just sacrifice one of your cheese graters and, and go to town. And of course, we have varying uh, types of sand. Um, there, we have finer sands and coarse sands. Uh, okay, let's see if I can jump back to my camera, because I do have all these with me. I'm gonna do stop share. Can you see me now? Okay, so I'm just gonna hold up like our basic cement sand that we use in the nursery. We use this in our liner mix um, as well as our seed mix for germinating seeds. And it's just, it's not that fine, right? It's like, it's more coarse than beach sand, but not as coarse as let's say, I don't know, like a kitty litter or something like that. It's just somewhere in between. And then we also have a topper sand, which we kind of use as a makeshift mulch. And that's, this is like the, mo the most coarse we get, our sand. And this is like a number, I believe we, we buy it from Wolf Embargers and we get it, it's called like a number 12 silver sand or something like that. Okay, um, let's see, back to my screen. And yeah, I can show you some perlite as well, but let's continue with this list. Um, where are we at? 
what's going on? Okay, there we go. Oh, uh, vermiculite also, we use vermiculite not as much. Uh, we use vermiculite mostly for cold stratifying our seeds, which I'll get, get into in a bit. Um, it has a bit more water holding potential than perlite, but it's not as, as great as something like peat moss or coco coir. It's also, it's also um, innate. It doesn't have any like chemical component to it or anything like that. Um, let's see, what else? And of course, if we're thinking about mediums, we don't have to think about things that are like soil-based or you know, fiber-based. We can, in some cases, just a cup of water is good enough to root your cutting or you know, to germinate your seed. And it's really, you can get creative. It's anything that can hold moisture and that can buy you time in between waterings. Um, you can also get like wood shavings. Of course, try to get composted wood shavings or composted sawdust sometimes for cold stratting. Even like a napkin can germinate seeds. Like if you just wanna get a paper towel, put it in a warm place in your home, throw the seeds over it and just keep it moist like every day. I've, I've read of some people getting, having some good success with that, as well as with rooting um, leaf cuttings and other cuttings. And, and of course, um, in a more sophisticated like lab setting, uh, they use even agar to germinate seeds. And of course, that's getting into another discussion of like tissue culture and all that crazy stuff, right? Um, okay, onward. So we've discussed our ingredients. Let's look over the tools and equipment. Um, some basic bypass pruners, scissors, pruners for hardwood, um, scissors I use for softwood and, and um, smaller, smaller stems. Uh, a knife or a sharp edge can be used for wounding. Of, again, going back to exposing that cambium, right? Uh, and of course, some refrigerator space is also good to have if you want to um, uh, store your cuttings or, or cold strat, which we'll get into a bit more. Uh, aluminum foil is always good to have if you're trying to do like a dark treatment. Um, you can just prepare your, your seed flat, sow your seeds, and then cover it all with aluminum foil, which blocks out all the light. And uh, plastic wrap and just various bags are good to have. The plastic wrap can be used to um, cover your seed flat, let light pass through, and also maintain some moisture and humidity within that little area. Uh, same thing with bags. If you want to, you can even just get a, a a plastic bag, like a an extra shopping bag or something, and cover your flat with that, and it's good to go. Um, yeah, going back to transparent coverings. The, these the the goal here is just to control your humidity and the moisture of your substrate that you're trying to germinate your seed in. Um, so yeah, if we're trying to think about like a quick and dirty way, you can just get, you know, your paper towel, which is moist throw your seeds and just stuff all of that in a Ziploc and see what happens. Like, uh, like you can probably get some good success with that. Uh, and yeah, containers for, you know, rooting cuttings, for keeping seeds, um, germinating, um, just get creative. You can recycle some egg cartons or, you know, clean out your old milk containers and use that. Uh, be sure to poke holes in it to allow for drainage. Um, of course, I have some nursery grade containers with me that I'll go over with you. So let's stop share real quick. Okay, so yeah, in the nursery, we use like these deli containers sometimes. We use these for storing seeds. Um, occasionally, we'll mix like small amounts of mix of uh, planting medium in there. Um, let's see. Also have, this is like a tray that we'll use for seed flats. You can see that the light's passing through the holes there, right? For, to allow for drainage. Um, it's about, you know, two inches deep and, you know, maybe nine by nine inches wide. Okay, very small, very compact. We also have a, a much larger version if we're trying to produce a lot of cuttings at once. It's about like four of these tiled together. That's kind of the dimensions of it. And again, it, it has holes in the bottom to allow for drainage and aeration. That's very important. Uh, you, you need to have something with holes, otherwise you're going to get an anaerobic smelly condition that's not good for germinating or rooting cuttings. Um, uh, going back to our planting mediums, I do want to show the perlite. Here it is right here. This is medium size, just so you get an idea, you know, compared to my fingertip. Okay, uh, let's see. And I've got this um, screened peat moss. 
the consistency is much finer than when you get it in the bale. It's just very, very, very fine. Okay, like grated cheese, really. It's very satisfying to uh, to process as well. Okay, back to the share screen. But, uh, okay, let's see. So yeah, we went over containers. It's also good to have just various large tubs, large buckets, containers that are going to be easy to clean and prepare and mix your rooting media in, okay? Um, this can be as simple as like a $5 bucket from Home Depot or like a $1 bucket from the dollar store, something like that. Um, I use a uh, oil drip plastic can at home, a plastic dish at home that you, uh, that mechanics use for like changing their oil or something like that. And I just use that for mixing my, mixing my perlite and whatnot. Um, and of course, some optional materials, use these if you're comfortable with it. These are, you know, things like bleach and alcohol. Alcohol is best used for metallic surfaces because it won't rust them out as much as bleach will, or if at all. Um, bleach, of course, don't use it in its concentrated form. It's always best to dilute it to a 5% or a 10%. 10% um, is generally the norm for work surfaces and for, yeah, tools and stuff like that. And there are some commercial products that you can buy that are specifically for sanitizing the surfaces of your plant cuttings, um, as well as seeds. Um, the one we use in the nursery is called um, Fizan, and it's, a, it's like a very concentrated soap, essentially. And it just surface sanitizes the cuttings, okay? Uh, and of course, rooting hormone, it's not always necessary, um, but it is gonna increase your chances of success. And I'll go over some brands for that as well. And a heating pad is always good to have. It's not, again, optional. Um, if, you're, if, you're, if you're trying to root cuttings in the summer, you're probably in a good spot because it's warmer during those months. But if you're trying to do it during the winter, maybe you wanna think about getting a heating pad that can bottom, uh, uh, give bottom warmth to the seat flat. Um, all right, so we'll move onward. Danielle, is there, there any questions that I can or topics I can elaborate on? Yes, we do have a few questions. Yeah, of course. Um, let's see here. Um, someone says that they have peat compacts. Can plants take that or? Oh, are those like little bricks maybe? Not quite sure. Peat yeah, I haven't heard of it. yeah. I'm assuming it's like it's like a little nugget of peat moss. I would try to break it up. Um, yeah, um, anything that's compacted when you're trying to germinate seed or root a cutting is typically gonna um, block out too much uh, oxygen. It's gonna be too anaerobic and it's not gonna favor root growth and gas exchange between the seed and the environment. So if, you, it, as, if it's mostly peat in that peat compact, then I would just break it up into just what it, what it is and then use that. All right, great. Um, let's see here, uh, cold stratifying. Is it better to do it dry or wet using the vermiculite that you mentioned? Um, uh, or does yes. it depend on the seed? Yeah, well, we'll get into that some more, but yeah, um, there, are <laughs> some, there are some circumstances where you can do a, cold, uh, a dry cold strat. Um, in the nursery, we do usually do uh, wet cold strats, and that is using vermiculite and Ziploc bags, and it does largely depend on the seed. Um, for the most part, though, a wet cold strat is what we use. More to come. <laughs> oh yes, very much. Um, <laughs> all right, let's see, another one. Uh, the water here in the Claremont LA area is very hard. Is it okay to uh, use water out of the tap or is it better to use a filtered water? You know, if, it, if you're really trying to up your chances of getting successful germination, then I would use DI water. And in some cases we do use DI water, um, especially if you're trying to germinate like, uh, what is it, Car carnivorous plant seeds, I think they, they can't take hard water at all. Um, it's really what you're comfortable with. It's not going to like be a deal breaker if you use tap water, even if it is hard like it is in Claremont. Um, we do use mostly tap water here and we're fine. So. Okay, great. Um, let's see, I have a couple more and I'm wondering, they might be questions that you're about to cover here in the yeah, future. I'll, just, I'll ask just, just in case. Um, yeah. When taking cuttings, do you want to actually wound the lateral buds? Um, yeah, I can elaborate on that more. I typically try to retain the buds though and wound just below it. Great, okay. And then um, what proportions of perlite, pea, and sand do you use? Oh yeah, yeah, that's something I should have mentioned. So our seed mix is 
uh, three parts. It's perlite, uh, the cement sand, and the peat moss. Um, it's two parts perlite to one part cement sand and one part peat moss. And um, that's kind of a good balance that we found for our situation. You can try with other parts. You can really get creative with it. You can just try, um, and this is again for um, germinating seeds, right? If we're just doing cuttings, it's just straight perlite that we use. In some cases, we add a little bit of peat moss just to give it more of a spongy consistency. But yeah, that's our, that's our ratio that we use at the nursery and it works. All right, great, thanks. All good? All right, onward. Yeah, so we've got all our materials, we've got our knowledge, got our big brain here, and now we're gonna start uh, propagating, okay? Uh, I'll go over some like just brief step-by-steps and things to consider when you're propagating by seed. So let's go. So yeah, so if we're thinking about our imaginary toy on, right? Um, the seeds are, pr the, the fruit that it produces are pretty fleshy. And so one step in preparing the seeds, it's likely going to involve drying the fruit. And that's gonna allow it to be more workable, to be able to be broken up and then have that seed exposed, okay? Uh, and yeah, that leads to the second step slash topic, which is to separate your seed from the fruit. In some cases, it's a seed pod that, you know, it's pretty easy to clean, right? Like a, like a legume of some sort or like a, like a poppy. Those are super easy. You just kind of break the pot open and all the seeds fall out, right? Or maybe it's like a little nutlet that's in a sage uh, fluorescence. Those just need to be shaken out and it's very easy. But um, I selected Toyon because it is a bit more of a, a challenge to produce, uh, to propagate from. So yeah, you separate from, from the fruit. This is kind of optional. We don't really, in the nursery, we don't do this step, but I believe the restoration department does, as well as the, uh, the seed house, they, they employ this step, which is to kill any weevils and other insects that might eat your, uh, your seeds while they're being stored and propagated. Uh, this is very important for uh, acorns, from my understanding. There's a lot of weevils. Every time we get acorns in, they're always like riddled with holes. Um, we have to kind of sort through them and find the nice ones, you know? But yeah, that's optional. Um, the way to do that is to create a, a sealed container that um, at the bottom will have, you can like put a sponge at the bottom, okay? And saturate that sponge with alcohol or a nail polish remover. And then uh, a layer above that, you put some cardboard, um, which, which you then, which serves as a platform for your seeds to lay on. And so you throw your seeds onto the cardboard and then seal that container and just leave it for about, I would say 30 minutes. And that should really, that should really just suffocate any insects. I mean, it's a, it's a bit um, graphic, but that's, <laughs> that's what you gotta do if you wanna uh, save your seeds, you know? And yeah, we call that a bug box at the nursery. And um, I, I know that's the main method that um, bug collectors or like bug surveyors, that's what they use to collect their insects that they're studying. So yeah, there's a lot of information out there on creating bug boxes and bug containers like that. Onward. Getting a bit of lag here maybe. Oh, there we go. Oh, jumped forward. Uh, okay, and the last step is to prime or treat the seed, which I'll elaborate on more. Priming just means like soaking the seed with water. In some cases, you can throw it in a cup. Some cases, you can throw it in a cup and then just pour water over it and let that soak overnight from 12 to 24 hours. And that water will then imbibe the seed. It'll enter and saturate the seed and make it easier to germinate going forward. Um, and, as, and there's also um, some seeds require special treatments. Again, going back to our slides, talking about those in external conditions, right? Like burning or digestion or a, a cold stratification, an extended period of cold temperatures. Um, these are some treatments that we can replicate at home if needed. And of course that comes with, you know, researching the plant that you're looking at. Um, let's see, any, let's see, you can use, yeah. So separating the fruit from the seed, we use blenders. Um, I think I have some images in here that that I'll go over with you with. Um, ah, yes, and of course we, this is kind of how we process some sage seeds. Um, these are the dried influ uh, inflorescence. And we just put those in this like rubber, rubber mat and we smash them to kind of break up those dried flower heads. 
we end up with something like that. These are sieves. These are copper sieves that are, you know, various grades, various uh, openings. Um, this isn't super necessary at home. This is just something that we do to give us more seed and like just maximize our chances. Um, this is kind of the final product on the left. What's on the left is what has, what contains the seeds. What's on the right is like the very fine material that's been filtered out. Um, for the production nursery, we're typically happy with this, this stage of separation and processing. You can see that there's still a lot of chaff in there. There's still a lot of um, dry plant materials from the flower head, but all the seeds are in there. And for our applications, it's fine. Um, if you talk to someone from the restoration nursery or from the seed house, um, they're probably going to tell you that they take this even further. They put it in a blower. They really try to get only as close to perfect seed um, uh, isolation as possible. And that can increase your chances, especially from, for some of the more difficult to propagate uh, seeds. But yeah, you can use like, again, um, a colander or something like that. Maybe even get creative and use like a flower processor or something like that. Uh, yeah, continuing. Okay, so let's get into the seed treatments, okay? Scarification. That's when we're trying to physically break open the seed coat that's covering some of these seeds. Going back to that uh, image of all the different types of seeds, right? Some of them have very thick seed coats that um, might need to be opened up by hand. And scarification is typically the way that we do this. Um, you can use sandpaper to just kind of scratch the seeds, a very fine grit um, sandpaper. Or, um, oh, an alternative to this is to do like a boiling water soak. The heat can sometimes break open the seed coat. So that's something you can probably do more easily at home. Um, just take your seeds and boil some water and let it sit, pour, pour the water over and just let it um, cool down on its own. And that very hot temperature should give you some success. Let's see. It's a bit of lag on my end. Come on, okay. Yeah, okay, so again, the hot water soak, it's, a, it's an alternative to scarification. And now let's get into cold stratification. This is something that we use a lot in the nursery. Um, if we're thinking about plants that typically grow in alpine conditions, high elevation, you know, they receive very cold, some, uh, very cold winters, right? And if we're trying to germinate that in, you know, sunny SoCal, we're gonna have likely need to uh, employ a cold strat. And that's typically like a three month period at anywhere between 30 to 50 degrees Fahrenheit. And um, in some cases, sowing seeds at this time of year in the late fall, um, going into winter is good enough actually. Or sowing, just sowing your seeds into your flat that you've prepared and leaving it outside. It's, it's sometimes very good uh, practice and it, it avoids you having to, you know, make space in your fridge or, you know, try to find a cooler or something like that, right? It's a very, um, um, very uh, a low, low, low effort method, right? Onward. Let me get this working. Yeah, and so burning and gibberellic acid, these are kind of impractical for home use. You can look into them more if you're interested, but we do use it in the nursery. Burning is, is literally just putting some dry material over the seed flat after you've sown the seeds and just lighting that on fire in a controlled burn. Um, and then gibberellic acid is a, is a chemical that we dilute and pour over seeds before watering them in. So the seeds have already been put in their flat they're already ready to go, they've been processed, it, right? And now we're just pouring this gibberellic acid that should um, liberate them from dormancy and like kind of force them to, to germinate. Um, priming again is going back to that 24 hour soak. That's a very easy thing you can do and a lot of seeds um, benefit from, from that. Come on. Yeah, so here's how we do it in the nursery with a fire treatment. Those are just pine needles that we light on fire. This is for um, germinating Romnia culturae seeds. 
That's that's the the Matalia poppy, and there they are, the little babies coming up out of the the burned pine. Very cool. Yeah, I would exercise caution when doing this, and I actually wouldn't recommend it for home use. <laughs> but it's just you know I want to let you know that that's out there. An alternative is probably boiling water treatment. You can look into that some more. That might do some similar similar stuff. Okay, so we're kind of thinking of our toyon, right? Applying this knowledge to our toyon, our imaginary toyon. We, we have the fruit, we're trying to break it open because it's a fleshy fruit and we just want the seeds. The problem with trying to sow seeds that are in a fleshy fruit, um, like with the toyon or even with like some tomatoes or something like that, right? It's a very juicy fruit. Um, the problem with that is that there's more potential for fungal growth for disease to be present in the soil, and then of course failure for the seedling. So we do want to get as much of the dry, of the wet material out. So yeah, we can break open the fruit, in which case we use a blender and we spread that pulp over a paper towel or over a porous surface that can then allow us to dry it out. And then once it's dry, this is optional. We can then begin to crack it apart and break it apart um, it gets like almost like a cracker consistency. It's kind of gross actually, but <laughs> it, we break it apart and then the seeds uh, separate very easily. And yeah, around this time actually is when we would sow it if we didn't want to cold strat or if we, let's say we wanted to try to germinate these seeds in May, the toyon is flowering. We can't really take cuttings of it and we have these seeds and it's May. Um, we'd have to cold strat it for three months, in which case we'd wait from May, June, July, and August is when we would then sow those cold strata seeds and we would have some success. Yeah, so there's the blender that we use. Those are the toyon fruit that have been thrown in there, suspended in a little bit of water, and we just nuke that with the blender and it breaks it all open. It looks really disgusting, but hey man, that's what it takes. And look, there it is. It's just like this big boogery mucus that we then put over a colander. And um, the idea then is to just kind of wash away any exudates, any uh, mu mucilage that the seed might produce, get as much moisture out, as much um, fruit content out. And then it's that pulp that we spread over very, as thinly as we can over a newspaper or over a paper towel, and then put that paper towels positioned on a surface that's porous you know, like a metal grate, a drying rack or something, if you have one lying around, would be perfect. Um, leave that outside, let it dry. Um, you might see some mold develop, in which case um, I would say it's fine for most parts, but try to remove what you can that's moldy. Let's see. Just waiting for this slide to go. Okay, there we go. Okay, so this is kind of going into, you know, we've processed our seeds, we have these seeds ready to go. Now let's get into our house or let's get into our workspace and start mixing our medium. I kind of touched on this earlier, right? You can experiment with different ratios of perlite, sand, cocoa coir, and peat. Um, the goal is to aim for high moisture retention and a mix that is light, okay? You don't want something that's like bogged down with a bunch of um, sand and it's super heavy and it's like, like a clay soil, that's not good. You want something that's very aerated, very fluffy, and that's gonna act like a nice sponge for your seed or cutting. Let's continue. Yeah, sorry, there's a bit of a delay here. Yeah, it's always good to use clean, unopened materials. Um, you can reuse these materials, you know, like perlite, your coca coir. Um, it might be a bit smelly if you're trying to do it in your house. If you want to use like the oven or the microwave, just be warned. Um, but it is for the most part, okay. Don't put any metal in, in the microwave, okay? But yeah, use plastic containers and stuff like that. I would, I would use the oven if, if, it were, if it were my idea. Um, or you can also just leave it outside during the summer in a, in a sealed plastic bag and it'll solarize in like, you know, 90 degree temperatures and you'll get clean soil and like, three weeks or something like that. This is peak summer. Um, and again, no fertilizers necessary for your seed mix. We're just simply trying to get the root to come out of that seed. And once the roots and the first true leaves have come up, then you're good to go. You can take it out of that uh, seed flat and then stick it into a smaller pot um, to then that, the, the pot that can have fertilizer, that pot. 
And again, going back to this idea of a planting medium, these are seeds that are germinated in agar. And you know, the function is still being served. It's holding moisture and allowing for gas exchange. And that will work. OK, so let's then start planting our seeds. Uh, your first step is to saturate your, your mix as heavily as you can before sowing the seeds. OK, this is going to ensure maximum contact between your mix and the seed. Um, and it's also going to allow you to apply a lighter watering after you sow. OK, um, you are trying to avoid pooling all the seeds in one corner of your flat. So you saturate heavily, and that's what you work with. Um, the planting depth usually should equal the width of the seed. So a larger se seed should be buried deeper than the smaller seed. Um, some seeds like Escholtzia californica, they just need to be thrown, scratched into the seed surface. They're so small, you just need to dust them over your seed flat and you're good to go. Something like an um, acorn, though, that'll have to be buried, you know, about an inch. Okay, plowing ahead. Waiting for it to load. Um, yeah, and again, that silver sand or that, yeah, that silver sand I showed you earlier, it's a bit more coarse. That's what we use to top our seed flats. And it acts as a little bit, a little mulch layer. It's a very, very thin layer that we apply, really just enough to cover the planting mix. And what it does is it, it retains a little bit of moisture and it also softens the impact of our waterings. So that's something to consider. Um, yeah, you're going to have to practice a bit to find that sweet spot with watering, like you do with your garden and with your potted plants. It's the same with, you know, watering your seeds. You do not want to let them dry out. And again, your seed flat doesn't need to be too deep. Two inches is fine. Um, yeah, just stay on top of your, your moisture retention with your seed flats. Okay, Danielle, anything that I can elaborate on? Yeah, we have a few questions here about um, some of the treatments uh, you were talking yeah. about. Um, let's see, we have a couple questions. Is there some type of reference book, website, or um, like a guide resource yeah. that gives us um, information about which treatments should be used for which plants? Yeah, so I do, I have some books with me that I can show you guys that I did mean to show at the, at the start. So this is like the propagation Bible that I personally use. This is what I used um, in college and what I studied from. I'll, we'll probably send a picture of the cover to you afterwards. Um, it's a very thick book. Um, it's, it's great for learning all the theory, all the concepts, all the, um, and as well as the techniques. It elaborates on pretty much every type of propagation uh, technique. Um, and also at the very bottom, at, at the very end of the book, there is a, um, a reference section that details seed treatments and cutting treatments for different plants. It's not every plant, of course. It'll have like just like one um, ceanothus that it'll uh, give details on, not all the ceanothus. So, but it's a start, definitely. And then in the nursery, we use this quick handbook, seed propagating. And um, it's very thin. It's really just a reference book. There's not a lot of information. You open it up and you get like these lists. Okay, the left column is like the plant name. I believe the, the next column just shows, what is it? Yeah, the common name and then a brief treatment. Some say, you know, like this one says, three months cold strap for uh, this Western leatherwood. And you know, it's just a very quick, an easy thing to read and just a starting point. So yeah, those are the two books that I would recommend. There are some, there are two or three websites that I have that I'll link at, or that will link at the end of the talk that do have some free information as well. Um, everything in this slide set is from this big propagation manual. I use this for, for everything, it's awesome. Um, okay, so let me go back to my screen share. Anything else, Danielle? Yeah, we have a few more. Um, examples of seeds that might need um, specifically the scarification treatment we were talking about? Ah, uh, yes. Um, let's see. So some ceanothus need that. Um, basically, you want to look at the seed and if it has a very robust, hard seed coat. That, that will benefit from scarification. Anything that's like more fleshy, something like a um, like a like a premature uh, lupin seed that's like a bit soft, that might that won't need 
um, uh, scarification. That should be fine. All right, and then we had a couple questions about the um, the burning treatment. One question is, what was the medium under the fire? And then the oh. second question was, um, after you burned the pine needles that were on top, did you leave those burnt out needles? Or did you uh, so the planting medium is still our same seed mix. We didn't do anything different. Um, we did line our flat though with um, aluminum foil. Um, our flats are plastic. They're like injected molded plastic. And so we line it with foil all around um, the inside. And that's just to control the temperature diffusion. You know, we don't want to mount the flat basically. And that's the only difference. And the pine needles are left on top. The, the, the seeds germinate through the pine needles. All right, great. One last one before we move Perfect. on. The seed mix, could you give us the proportions of the, the yeah, seed mix again? Uh, it's perlite, peat moss, sand. Uh, two parts perlite, one part peat moss, one part sand. Perfect. Cement Thank sand. You. Mm -hmm. All right, we good? Onward to cuttings. Okay, so we just went over some treatments for seeds. Um, I would say uh, seeds are, well, I don't know how I would rank seeds versus cuttings. Se seeds are their own problem just because there's so much variability, but cuttings are also pretty complicated. But I, I think the entry point into cuttings can be pretty easy, uh, pretty low, it's pretty easy. Uh, okay, let's talk about some plant tissues. Um, let's see, I, I believe I have some images that can elaborate on these a bit more. But of course, you're all familiar with the stem, which then leads into a leaf and there's a node there. Uh, flower buds, you do want to be able to identify flower buds so you, that you can then avoid taking cuttings. Um, and I'll have some pictures of callus and root initiates that we'll go over. But yeah, you also, it takes some practice to identify a callus because in some cases it does look like perlite. It's like this very rocky white uh, material that forms on the bottom of the stem. So a lot of the times you can mistake perlite for callus thinking that you've had a successful rooting. And of course, root initiates, being able to identify those helps a lot in the rooting process. How are we with time, Danielle? We are good. Nope, it is started a bit late, right? 12.04, so we'll be okay. wrapping up shortly. Yeah, yeah, we'll wrap up a bit. So yeah, I'll just steamroll through all these guys. Um, softwood, I have some images of a Ribes malvicium. Um, this is soft, it's very easy to practice on things like ribes or a flannel bush because the tissue types are so distinct. The softwood on a ribes, you can tell here it's very glandular and it's very, very light green and fleshy, right? Um, they contain young tissues that are actively dividing. Um, and also because um, they're so young, the stress is minimal when collecting from a parent plant. Um, some other examples that do well from softwood cuttings are sages and bush poppies. Um, yeah, hardwood bush poppies don't really do well, but softwood, we've had a bit more success rooting them. And the cons, of course, they are more vulnerable because they're so porous and, and, um, and young to over and underwatering. They lose moisture more quickly because they're so herbaceous. And also in some cases, they lack structure and are just overall difficult to handle. So that's something to weigh when you're, when you're thinking about what cuttings to take. And of course, hardwood cuttings. Here's an example of that same ribes. Um, it's not a great example because it is only about a two-year plant, but you can see the difference between the hardwood and softwood. It's the hardwood's very, very dark. It's lost that that uh, glandular uh, surface. You can take more rigid cuttings using hardwood. They can be larger, um, and they are the preferred method for cuttings of deciduous plants. Uh, here's some examples, you know, willows, flannel bush does pretty well from hardwood. Um, your California grape is perfect to practice on. Um, yeah, I would, if I was starting off, I would practice with a grape once it's gone dormant, once all the leaves have fallen. Um, oh, sorry, uh, berberis as well is a good one to practice on. But yeah, I should have thrown in just a normal Vitus Californica. That would be a great starting point. Um, but yeah, the problem with hardwood is they can take longer to root. Um, in many cases, you do need to wound them to expose that cambium layer because the hardwood can be so thick and you, do, you might have better success with the rooting hormone or stem uh, treatments. And um, 
Yeah, they're, it's not great to take hardwood cuttings during the rainy months because that wound is so much larger than on a flesh, on a softwood wound. Um, I, I'm talking about the parent plant, right? So you want to take it in dry weather where that wound can have time to heal without moisture. Uh, going on to semi-hardwood, this is that same Ribes malvaceum. Um, you can see how the, the surface is beginning to flake. It's beginning to darken a bit, but it's still, there's still some some bend to the stem if you were to poke it and like kind of manipulate it, right? Um, the bark is beginning to flake off. I would, I would remove that flaky bark just because it's gonna hold a bit more moisture and I don't want that. Um, yeah, it's a good balance between rigidity and growth potential. We use uh, soft semi-hardwood cuttings for penstemon, uh, trichostema, we do that a lot. Um, we also use softwood for trichostema. Flannel bush is perfect. Um, bush poppy, we have some success. And also the, uh, the berberis that I mentioned before, we have some success with semi-hardwood. Um, that's also a pitcher sage that you have right there, some semi-hardwood on a pitcher sage. You can tell it's like a bit darker than the fleshy uh, young wood, uh, young stem higher up. And, you know, because uh, I picked examples that are easy to identify, but other plants like some manzanitas, or some ceanothus, it can be a bit more tricky to identify the semi-hardwood. There's just so much variation and um, they can be very leafy as well, which will require a bit more trimming and processing for your cuttings. Okay, here's, uh, here's what we use in, in uh, the nursery for a uh, rooting hormone. This is an auxin solution suspended in alcohol. It needs to be diluted. So this is a concentrated form. I wouldn't recommend it for home use. Um, we have something else called Hormex that we've used in the past, and that's a pre-mixed, pre-processed um, powder that you can buy. And that I would think is less messy. I personally haven't used it, but it's just something to consider. And it, of course, these, met, these, um, uh, these chemicals aren't um, necessary. They're completely optional, whatever you're comfortable with. And so we kind of went over some cuttings, right? There's other ways to, to propagate. You can propagate via uh, leaf cuttings or root cuttings. I have an example of a sage cutting here. And that's really just the tip of a sage stem with two leaves on it. And the complete length of it is maybe like half an inch. And I was able to get roots coming out of that. And for that, I did use a rooting mix that's more water holding because I wasn't comfortable using just straight perlite like we do with our cuttings. So I, I, I believe I did a one-to-one -one perlite to peat moss because this propagula is so much smaller and there's a greater risk of uh, moisture loss, right? Okay, onward. Okay. So yeah, here's some examples of some rooted cuttings. That is not callus. That is just perlite attached to the roots, okay? Uh, yeah, let's go over some details to consider when, ta when taking and cutting um, your plants. You wanna heavily water the plant the evening before you take your cuttings, okay? This is gonna allow your plant to really be turgid and the cells in your plant to be turgid and healthy. Uh, take cuttings in the early morning, that following morning. Um, stick them as soon as you can, or you can store them in the fridge uh, for, I wouldn't store them for more than three days. After that, they, especially if they're very herbaceous, they tend to get kind of soggy and gross. Kind of use your best judgment. Um, but yeah, it's similar to like when you buy bags of lettuce or like a head of lettuce. That can only last so long, right? Um, yeah, avoid flowering stages. Take them in the off season when the plant is dormant or not flowering. Um, and if you want to use auxins, bleach solutions, alcohol, always wear proper PPE, wear your long sleeves, buy some latex gloves, wear some eye protection and be safe and work outdoors if you're mixing them. And here's just some more examples. These are stem cuttings of a Dudleya species. That's one plant, right? And you, you can see the various stems that are coming off. So I cut them. It's very simple. It's good practice. If you have a Dudleya that you're willing to sacrifice and there are all the processed cuttings. Those will dry out for about a month. Um, uh, if you wanted to shorten that, you could probably do two weeks. And then they're just stuck into 100% uh, pumice, just a pumice mix or perlite will be fine.
Okay, um, we're getting towards the end. Um, I'll just briefly touch on divisions. Some plants can be divided rather than um, cut. Like um, I have a few examples, um, anything that grows from like a bulb or anything that sends off runners can be propagated by divisions. Okay, so here's an example of a corm. That's something you'd find in a dicholostema, which is a blue dicks plant, right? They have these little bulbit, bulbs at the bottom that's buried and occasionally um, there'll be smaller corms that develop. And when you're propagating them, you can dig up this entire corm once it's gone dormant, of course, not when it's actively growing, but in the off season when it's dormant, you can dig it up and simply just pry them apart. It's very easy and you get more plants that way. And of course, you can see these cormals, which are initiates. Those are those will eventually become new corms. All right. So yeah, in some cases, it involves physically cutting a mature plant into smaller plants. Let's see. Yeah, so you need to do some research into understanding how your plant is growing. Some grow via rhizomes. Um, let's see, what's an example of that? I believe some mallows grow that way. A malacothamnus, a free montii might grow that way. Uh, some have tuberous roots that are very swollen and can be cut up. Um, some grow, some spread via stolons, which are uh, horizontal stems that run along the ground. Um, strawberries are a great example of that. Those can be divided very easily. Um, let's see, uh, Salvia spathacea, hummingbird sage. That's a very great uh, plant to practice dividing on. Um, and yeah, some plants like bulbs and corms can simply just be pulled apart. And I have uh, an example of a cicerinchium that I can show in a bit. One word. Yeah, so these are some examples of plants that don't need to be physically cut apart. They have growth forms that can just be pulled apart, like bulbs and corms, calicordis, mariposa lily, that can be pulled apart if you dig it up in the off season. Um, yeah, just some more examples, tubers, rhizomes, corms, and bulbs. Plants that grow by these means can be divided, either by cutting them apart, tubers and rhizomes will need to be cut with a knife or uh, physically like broken apart, um, anything from a corm uh, or growing from a bulb will need less processing. You can just pull them apart once you dig them up. And of course, we're still following the sanitation and the steps of uh, you know our cuttings and seeds. Uh, they can go into similar mixes, just a seed mix or with some fertilizer in it. Uh, okay, layering is the last topic that I'll just briefly uh, touch on. Um, this is a, a, a low low stress method um, um, compared to, you know, propagating by cuttings or divisions. Um, you're simply just uh, manipulating the stems on a parent plant and subjecting them to conditions that will promote root growth from that attached stem. So the stem is still receiving nutrients from the parent plant, but because you've buried it or bent it down to the soil, it's now in an environment that will hopefully promote adventitious root growth. So yeah, it simulates a buried stem, which does happen naturally, right? If a, if a, if a large bush is trampled slightly or you know, if there's a, a something that falls on top of it and buries the stems of that large shrub, um, eventually over time, those stems that are in contact with the so soil will begin to root and um, form new plants. So yeah, once that stem has rooted into the ground, um, they can be cut from the parent plant and because they'll be self-sustaining at that point. Um, so yeah, here's a, an example that I have that the, of what we've done in the nursery. That's a large um, Rosa minutifolia. Uh, he, those are some stems that I've just weighed down with bricks. And below it is a, is a flat with, uh, I believe it's one-to-one -one, uh, perlite and sand. I, I'm sorry, a, a peat moss and sand. And yeah, I just let that sit over, I believe it was the summer for two months and summer. Yeah, and the fall is when we dug it up, if I remember correctly. And yeah, you can see a few months later, the right image, that's when I just eventually cut it from the parent plant. And we were, we were, we were able to get some one gallons off of that. 
Okay, plowing ahead. Oh, and yeah, I believe that's all. Any, I'm sure there's a ton of questions, Danielle. What do we got? Yes, all right, so we can take some more questions. Please go yeah, ahead and put those thing. in the Q&A. Um, we'll just wait a moment. I'll take this time to mention that today's lecture is recorded and in a few days it will be made available on our website, calbg.org. Um, there's a digital content section. You'll be able to find um, today's recorded lecture. Let's see, I'll go ahead and start with some of the questions we already have. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so after the cuttings have been started, is it okay to um, pull some out periodically and check on the progress and then stick them back? Yeah, so we do do that in the nursery. Try to be very clean when you're doing it. Use uh, gloves that are sanitized with alcohol. Um, you can um, do just a, a very gentle tug on the cutting. And if you do get some resistance, then you're in a good spot. It does take some practice to um, tell between uh, a cutting that's rooted versus a cutting that's just, you know, still compacted into the perlite. You know, they, they do feel the same in most cases. Um, but yeah, I usually do that check maybe every week with my cuttings, m maybe every other week for some other cuttings that take longer. But yeah, that's totally a good thing to do. You can, in some cases, randomly pull a cutting out just to look at it. Um, but again, just be clean with it. Let's see. Um, someone said, um, do you, um, can uh, Douglas Iris manage well using um, divisions? Yeah, I believe that's the primary way that they're um, that they're propagated. You have to wait until they've gone dormant, though. So when they're flowering and leafing out, um, that's when you can kind of flag them and find them in your garden. And then I believe the ones that go dormant, you can just dig up and propagate that way. All right. Let's see here. Um, do we have an optimum um, a seed treatment for salvias, specifically salvia? Apiana, if possible? Salvias are pretty easy to grow by seed. Um, there are some treatments out there because I believe some salvias do get kind of um, mucousy when you water them, like they exude a, a gummy material. So um, I believe I've treated them with a hot water soak in the past. Just pour boiling water over them and let them sit for, you know, like a day overnight. All right, great. We have um, a couple people, let's see, poppies are popular. Um, yeah. We want to know, uh, what is the um, best time to plant poppy seeds? Poppy seeds. So if you're in a more temperate area, you can do it right now. Um, now's a good time. But if you're kind of like in the high desert or somewhere that's getting very heavy winter temperatures, um, I would wait until late winter, early spring to sow my poppies. And they're, they're good to go just straight into the garden, into the ground. You don't need to really do anything special with them. They're very easy. They're, they're a great, great seed to start off with. Absolutely. Let's see. Um, is there a brief answer that we could give to the um, difference in the results versus um, sexual and asexual reproduction? This was back from the beginning. <laughs> yeah, so um, let's see. So sexual reproduction is very great for diversity and you know, if you're looking to get into like a breeding program or trying to find new cultivars, that's, that's largely how it's done is via sexual, just because you get so much diversity, so much chance for, for new flower types to potentially develop, albeit a very, very, very small chance, but the chance is still there, right? Um, and uh, asexual is really how we bulk up any, uh, how we bulk up our, um, our stock, you know, it's a very easy way to get large plants sooner, large mature plants sooner. And so that's really like the, the big difference from a, from a production standpoint. Um, from a restoration standpoint, I think it is better to, to propagate via seed just because you're introducing more diversity into any, you know, site you're trying to rehabilitate. But of course, I think via asexual, it's still a net positive to get these clones into people's homes, I believe, and it's totally fine for home use. Yeah, great. Um, we had a question come in during cuttings. Um, it was specifically when you were showing the, the pictures of the Dudleya. Um, how do you pick where to cut? Yeah, so let's see if I can go back to it. I just picked somewhere in the center. You see like these, can you see my cursor? 
Mm -hmm. sure. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So yeah, these two were attached. I cut it in, down the middle. And I'm trying to retain as much of the whole stem as I can. Okay. And yeah, it's good to exercise. Um, you don't want to be too greedy with it. You know, if I wanted, I could try to cut down because you can see two growing tips are here. This one's growing that way. This one's growing that way. If I wanted to, I could cut down here, but you're leaving very little stem left. You want to try to leave a good amount of stem because there are storage tissues in that stem that will sustain the cutting as it's trying to root out. All right. Somebody was asking about our example plant. Um, can you layer toy on? Yeah, you can. Um, and there are other, there are several techniques of layering as well that I wasn't able to get to. There's air layering, there's mounding. Air layering is uh, you, you select a part of your plant and you wrap it, you, you cover a section of the stem with uh, peat moss or something very absorb, absorb, um, with high absorb potential. And then you, you soak that peat moss and wrap it in saran wrap and then wrap that again with a layer of foil to darken it. And what that does, it simulates a buried stem, but it's suspended in the air because you're picking an upright stem on your plant. That's air layering. Mounding is the technique that I described where you're bending the branch down to contact the soil and then weighing it down with a brick. Um, yeah, you can totally try that with, with Toyon. Um, the drawback is it's a lot of work to set that up. You don't get a lot of plants out of it, right? So it's, it's great for difficult to grow plants, um, rare species that grow very slowly that you don't really want to stress out. It's a very non-intrusive way. Um, but again, it only yields, you know, like one, a couple plants because you're not going to sit there unless you're going to dedicate like an entire day to air layer, like dozens of stems. It's just not that practical. Right, right. All right. Someone asked if you could show the cover of the thin reference book again. Yeah, of course. So let me go to stop share. Uh, there I am. Here's the cover. Can you see it well? Yeah, I'm not sure what it's priced at. We've had this in the nursery for years, just what I use. And I'm sure there's another version of it. We're gonna send out, um, there's gonna be an email early next week. Kristen will email everybody the names of these books that Stephen mentioned, the website links he mentioned, and the link to the presentation once it's on our website. So yeah, she great. will email everybody, um, everybody those titles. So we have those handy. And uh, let's see, we'll take um, one last question here. Um, how much would you say um, hormone treatment helps? Oh yeah, of course. Um, so when I'm using the dip and grow, uh, the concentration I use is between a 15% and a 30%. And I'm usually somewhere in the middle there with a 20% dilution. So that means I put if we're using a graduated cylinder, that's 100 milliliters, right? I would pour out my dip and grow to the 20 mark and then top it off to 100 with water. So 20% of it is out of the bottle. And then the rest, the last 80% is just tap water. And that's what I use. Um, for hardwood cuttings or for like difficult to root cuttings, I'll bump that up to like a 30%, maybe a 35. Um, and then for very herbaceous cuttings, I'd go down to like 10 to 15%. Because it's not really, it's it, you or none at all for something like, I don't know, like a, a like a very fleshy sage plant should be fine without rooting hormone. Um, also, the Hormex, which I I do have with me actually, it's a rooting powder. Here's the label. I have I don't have experience using this. It's just something we have in the nursery that we've used in the past. Um, but it is a powder, and it comes in in. Um, pre-diluted. You don't have to mix it with anything. You just roll, you just apply it with a cotton, a cotton swab or roll your cutting around in it and then stick that into your perlite flat. All righty. Sounds good. Thank you so much, Stephen. Thank you everybody for joining us this afternoon. Yeah. Thanks for spending your Saturday with me. I hope you all have a good holiday. It's great to, to be able to talk about this stuff with you guys. Thanks so much. Absolutely. Thanks everybody. Have a good one. Bye-bye.